All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Cape Cod Technology Council's Indoor Air Quality Summit. I'm Bert Jackson. I'm the CEO of the Cape Cod Technology Council. And I want to welcome you all here today. Um, very excited about this. Uh, we had a session with Dr. Jane Ward back in November for one of our, of our coffee Q&As about this topic, and the interest was so great, we decided to do a more formal event, and that was the genesis of today's event. Um, the Cape Cod Technology Council is a membership organization that promotes technology, entrepreneurship, education, and policy in our region. I uh, just want to say a couple of thank yous. Uh, first of all, uh, a big thank you to our sponsors today, um, without whom we couldn't have had this event on board. And uh, so Cape and Plymouth Business Media, uh, Cape Associates, who are now offering HVAC services, Cape Light Compact, uh, and you can go to their website and sign up for a free home or business energy assessment. Cape Space, Catalyst Architects used to be, um, I'll never remember all the names, but they're a wonderful architectural firm uh, that, that designed Cape Space, among other things. Um, Roby's Heating and Cooling and Shepley Wood Products. So thank you all so much for, for helping us uh, uh, put this event on today. I'd also like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Ward for helping to organize this. Uh, she did yeoman's work in, in helping uh, uh, pull together uh, Dr. Stephanie Taylor and Scott Ellis from, from Onset. And also a big thanks to Robin Orbison, the chair of our program committee, uh, also the owner of Cape Space, who did a, a wonderful job in organizing this as she does uh, with all of our events. Um, I would like to introduce Dr. Jane Ward uh, who's going to tell you about our event today and what's going to happen and introduce our speakers, Dr. Jane Ward. Well, thanks, Bert and um, Robin, and thanks for in inviting us to uh, present this. I think indoor air quality has become an uh, obsession of mine. This last year, it was a, a, of interest before, but it's been a, an obsession during the pandemic because I see it as a way that we can uh, empower all of us to stay healthier in our own homes or businesses and be able to uh, more safely come back together again once we get through this pandemic. And I've chosen as this uh, byline or subtitle, make the invisible visible because our two speakers will lead you through why uh, attention to indoor airspace and air quality is so important uh, for staying healthy and how do we ensure that the uh, efforts that we've made are actually uh, having an effect and making our indoor air, uh, indoor environments safer. So I'm going to um, uh, be introducing Stephanie Taylor from uh, Stowe, Vermont, who's both a physician and an architect, and Scott Ellis, who's from Onset Computer, one of our Cape Cod uh, Tech Council um, member organizations. But first, I want to give you just a little bit of a sense of where we are and why this is uh, an issue that's becoming more and more important every day. And I have a summary slide of COVID numbers. You're probably all dreading the updates uh, daily. Two days ago, we had over 7 million confirmed cases in the US, nearly 500,000 deaths. We're approaching what happened in 1918, where the flu pandemic killed 675,000 in the US and 50 million uh, worldwide. And it was very interesting that during that pandemic in Boston, where we had thousands of uh, sailors returning from World War I, those that were, uh, there was no space in the inn and their beds were moved outdoors, actually survived three times better than patients who were kept indoors uh, for the uh, duration of their treatment. Um, we have a baseline problem in this country that many of us maybe are not aware of, especially if we live in a place like Cape Cod that has generally good outdoor air quality but about half of our population in the US live in cities and urban areas and other areas near industrial sites and power plants where air pollution is so bad that it's unhealthy outdoors and outdoor air pollution can make COVID illness more severe. Most of us don't even realize that indoor air pollution because we can't see it 
is actually two to, two to five times worse than outdoor air pollution. That's an EPA calculation. So we're gonna to focus today on how do we optimize indoor air quality? In addition to the CDC recommendations to wear masks, clean surfaces and maintain personal hygiene and stay far apart in order to reduce our chance of getting the illness and of course, get a vaccine when you can. And we're gonna to touch on these steps uh, listed below and how to uh, improve your air quality. I don't know why I'm not advancing. There we go. So here's, a, here's an illustration of Boston hospitals, outdoor tent hospitals during the 1918 flu pandemic. The survival in those who were moved outdoors for part of the day was three times better than those indoors. And here's just a reminder that 90% of our time in the US, we spend indoors with a air quality that's two to five times worse than outdoors. We're gonna to focus today on airborne particles. And this is particularly important because there's growing evidence that this pandemic is spread not just by droplets when people cough or sneeze and they're symptomatic, but by uh, aerosols and airborne particles that are spread just by talking or um, uh, breathing. And there is this super spreader phenomenon where 20% of the ill individuals are, are responsible for 80% of the spread and we've been told over and over again, avoid indoor events, avoid crowds indoors and poor ventilation. So see if I can. So uh, we wanna make the invisible, the air quality, we wanna make it visible and we need to measure that. Lord Kelvin, a famous scientist that they uh, named the Kelvin uh, temperature uh, grid for, said when you can measure what you are speaking about and express it in numbers, you know something about it. So Stephanie Taylor from Stowe, Vermont is a, a Harvard Medical School trained physician. Uh, she's an ASHRAE distinguished lecturer and a member of their epidemic task force. ASHRAE, for those of you who don't know that acronym, is our American Society of Heating, Refrigerating and Air Conditioner Engineers. They're the folks who design our, uh, our indoor air heating and cooling systems uh, and uh, teach us how to improve it. She's uh, um, lecturing many times a week during this pandemic and she's went back to school uh, partway through her career to become an architect because she couldn't figure out why so many of her patients were getting sick in the hospital. So Stephanie, I'm gonna turn turn it over to you. This is a reminder that ASHRAE has tons of, uh, of um, information for us. If you go to their website, they can tell you what to do in just about any type of space or transportation. And I'm going to stop my slides and turn it over to Stephanie. Awesome. Thank you, Jane, Dr. Ward. I, um, before I jump on, I under my presentation, I met Dr. Ward through the, uh, the Health and Buildings Roundtable at the NIH. And Dr. Ward is an example of one of these very progressive, forward-thinking women who just doesn't seem to be able to stop coming up with uh, new ideas and new areas of interest. So I'm very impressed. <laughs> my focus has been on including uh, the indoor environment in, in managing human health. So next slide, please. So Bert, you're advancing them? Yeah, because I sent them to you. So uh, these are the three areas I'd like to talk with you about medicine and buildings, some studies, and then scaling health. The next one, please. So again, uh, this was after that adventure with Zoom just now. This going back to the um, 1980s is me when I was in medical school and I wanted to have an adventure. I didn't really know that I would learn everything that I learned, but I uh, did want to have a, an adventure and I did. I was in Papua New Guinea, um, stationed in Wewak, which is uh, at the head of the Seabic River. The next slide. Uh -oh. And when I was uh, in Papua New Guinea for four months, I was stationed in this hospital, the Wewak General Hospital. And 
I was a little surprised when I got there about the, you know, sort of the conditions of the hospital. I didn't know what to expect, but it, this seemed a little more non-hygienic than I had thought it would be. You can see uh, the men's tuberculosis ward on the lower left, and that's me in the operating room, sort of gawking at a patient who was about to have surgery. We would wear flip-flops in the hospitals. Uh, the nurses didn't wear gloves. But another thing that surprised me was that these patients did really well. They didn't have additional infections um, and they went home kind of when we thought they would. And I thought about it. Um, and when I got back to medical school, I was talking with my mentor, Dr. Folkman, who an amazingly brilliant and wonderful guy. And I worked with him actually for six years. And I said to Dr. Folkman, you know, something was going on because these patients did so well in this apparently non-hygienic environment. And Dr. Fogman told me, he said, never underestimate the power of the environment in human health. And he said, sometimes the things that, you, that are impactful, we can't see. So don't always assume that you're seeing the whole story. So the next slide, please. So speaking of the environment, if we go back in time and take a really broad perspective of human beings and our, our shelters, you know, clearly a long time ago, we lived in shelters where we had lots of communication with outdoor air, like Jane Ward, Dr. Ward was talking about with the, uh, the soldiers in World War I. Then our building materials and technology clearly became more sophisticated. We developed amazing high uh, sanitation systems. We went through the Industrial Revolution where our work and living moved indoors. And now by 2021, when many of us, when we were going to our offices, we were, we were in very beautiful high-tech buildings that were sealed up, maybe a lot of air uh, recirculation. Often the windows are non-operable. And the next slide. But interestingly, despite these advances in building technology, we've also seen from a, from a very high level, we've seen an increase in certain disease categories, which is very surprising. So uh, as you see here, as we moved into it, <coughs> and ASHRAE implemented lots of regulations around energy uh, conservation, we've tightened up our buildings, However, we've seen an increase in many infectious diseases and in some uh, allergic diseases and autoimmune disorders. So while this slide in front of you is clearly not a statistical analysis, it, it bears asking the question, are we doing something with our buildings that's actually counterproductive to our health? And the next slide, Bert, or the next click. One of my colleagues, Dr. Dickerman, borrowed this from Winston Churchill, modified the saying a little bit, and said, we shape our buildings, then they kill us. So that's, Dr. Dickerman was a man of few words, but that was his opinion. So how do we take a look at that? Next slide. So throughout time, it's really, really interesting. The viral pandemics that have been upon us human beings, um, and I'm just depicting three of them, have had several things in common. For one thing, all of these pandemics that you see here have been caused by the same category of viruses. They've been caused by single-stranded RNA viruses. And you may be thinking, well, okay, that's interesting, but I don't really care, or why is that important? The reason it's important is that single-stranded RNA viruses have an incredible capability to mutate and form new strains that they, these viruses don't have the proofreading mechanisms that, for example, double-stranded DNA genetic uh, governance does, such as in our cells. So it's kind of like my eighth, my son, when he was in the eighth grade, he'd write a history paper, he wouldn't manage to proofread it, he'd send it off to his teacher and get a C because of all the mistakes. That's kind of like a single-stranded RNA virus. The other thing that's interesting is that all of these pandemics whether we knew it at the time or not, had a very significant airborne component. Even the bubonic plague we now know was most powerfully spread by the pneumonic uh, version of the virus. So here we are, COVID-19, it should say 2021. Uh, next slide, please. 
So the CDC has, has finally uh, acknowledged that airborne transmission is the most powerful route of transmission. And not just the large droplets that land within one to two meters or three to six feet, but the fine aerosols that have the capability of spreading further uh, over greater distances and through time. So this came out um, two days ago on Wednesday. And there are the uh, 11 scientists on the, on the transition board. I'm, a, I'm an advisor within Atul Gwandi's group, but there, we wrote a letter that, to the CDC saying this route of transmission has to be addressed. So the CDC responded by saying, well, we're, we're uh, escalating our vaccinations. We're working on hand hygiene protocols and compliance. We're taking temperatures, we're doing contact tracing, uh, next click. Unfortunately, those strategies um, primarily, primarily address non-airborne uh, routes of transmission and prevention. So while it's great that the CDC is uh, doing something, we need to do more. Next step, uh, slide. So if you just click it again, Bert, please. So as I'm, this just is to give you a visual of what's going on in buildings. So as I'm talking and everyone's breathing, I hope you're breathing, droplets come out of our airways about hundred microns in diameter and they carry all of the normal bacteria and viruses and particles in our respiratory system. Doesn't mean we're sick, it means we're, we're just, that's the way humans are. We have lots of microbes in us. This engineer or architect is working away She's leaving her skin particles on the paper, on the desk. You can see particles coming out of her nose. These all carry the normal organisms that humans have. Our GI tract is illuminated. We uh, exchange those organisms with the air. And you can see that the, the particles and the microbes that are on surfaces also are resuspended into the air. They set, settle out of the air. So there's a very active exchange and communication between surfaces and air, because we don't live in a two-dimensional world. So it's really important when you're thinking about surfaces to also consider what your surface management is doing to the airborne component. Next, Bert. And we now know thanks to a whole new uh, set of tools called metagenomic analysis tools, where we can actually look at the DNA and RNA fingerprints of all of the microbes, meaning viruses, bacteria, and fungal organisms. We can now look at the fingerprints of those microbes on our bodies, in our bodies, and in our buildings. And from these, micro, uh, these metagenomic analysis tools, we've learned that number one, each of us is uh, like an ecosystem of microbes in clothes. We go into a building, we shed our microbes uh, into the spaces. And now, and I think this is fascinating, we know that depending on how a building is designed, used, and ventilated, certain organisms that can adapt to those conditions are going to survive. So in this, in this way, if you think about natural selection, the indoor environment where Dr. Ward said, we spend 90% of our time, the indoor environment has really become the most powerful driver of microbial selection, which shapes the human microbiome and it's, is very, very powerful in managing our health. Not just in the time of COVID-19, but, but all the time. And not only our health, not only our, whether or not we have a respiratory viral disease, yeah. but our productivity, our ability to learn the human microbiome is related to depression, anxiety, uh, vulnerability to uh, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, and pretty much every aspect of our life. So if you ever begin to wonder if what you're doing is important, just remember that the indoor environment is the most, in my opinion, the most powerful driver of public health. So next slide, please. So let's talk about a few studies um, that begin to look at human health in the indoor environment. Next slide. So will you just click that, Bert, so that this is uh, from an MIT. Oops, sorry, can you go back one and just like uh, make, if you just click on, yeah, 
somewhere you can make this this woman say this woman comes into your home um, and she starts spewing forth uh, the secretions from her respiratory tract she's coughing she doesn't have a mask on you can see here that as she coughs some of the part, some of the droplets are larger they settle fairly quickly within one to two meters but some of those tiny droplet droplets in the aerosol cloud actually can can travel very far and we used to think that the the tiny tiny droplets that become even smaller as they desiccate we used to think that those were non-infectious however we now know thanks to these metagenomic analysis tools that that particles or viruses or bacteria carried within the minuscule droplets that can travel far and wide um, actually are often quite infectious. The organisms within those droplets can be dormant, but they're, not, they're usually not dead. So that's a, another shift in our thinking since we've been using these new tools starting about seven years ago. So next slide. Uh, one more, please, Bert, please. So how do we, say that woman comes into our house, how do we protect ourselves from getting her illness if she's sick? Well, the first step, we can restrict our exposure to her, we can tell her to go away, we can lock our door, but it's really the middle column where we focus as architects, engineers, uh, you know, any building professional, builders, contractors, facility managers, it's usually the middle column here that we focus on. And we leave the right-hand column, taking care of your health and immunity up to either ourselves individually, by right, our diet, exercise, sleep, or clinicians, we hope for the vaccine. Next click, please. So let's talk about this column for a minute. Next click. You know, be, if we were coal miners and we wanted to know if if our indoor environment was being managed to support our health, we could we could release a, a canary into the coal mine, which is kind of sad. I like canaries, but canaries have a high oxygen demand. So if that canary came back alive and singing, the miners knew that um, the indoor air was probably okay to support their life, at least for a couple hours. We can't really release flocks of canaries into our buildings to assess whether or not they're managed for health. Next. Click. So what, what can we do? So this study, um, this is a study I was involved in in 2014 in a brand new hospital in the Chicago area. So we were looking at what we were asking the question of, does the indoor environment and specifically the patient room, uh, are there any variables in the patient rooms that relate to new patient infections or these health associated infections? So uh, over the course of 13 months, we, we took a brand new hospital, uh, all, all single rooms with uh, private rooms with vestibules, uh, you know, bathroom, single, I mean, sorry, private bathrooms. It was a lead silver hospital. We monitored every five to 30 minutes, the parameters that you see listed there, temperature, hand hygiene compliance, room pressurization, lighting, CO2, humidity, room traffic, room air, and outdoor air. The patient rooms look like uh, Home Depot had come to visit because they are filled with these sort of clunky, uh, unattractive sensors. So we took about 8 million data points from the environment and correlated them with new patient infections. So thankfully we had electronic medical records. So we were able to evaluate about 400. We, we sent a massive amount of data off to our statistician who came back, next slide, Bert, came back with this. The, the, the statistician team said, the most powerful correlation with more infections in the patient rooms is dry air. So you can see on the x-axis is the seasonal trend. Uh, the blue line is the average relative humidity in the patient rooms, red columns were infections. So I looked at this and I thought, wait a minute, this is seasonal. We, we hired a bad statistician. They missed some other variable. We fired them, got a new statistician who said, look, you guys, just because you didn't expect it doesn't mean it's not real. When the relative humidity was lower in the patient rooms around, around 30%, the infection rate was high. And, and 
the second statistician said, this is an independent variable. There are no, none of the other were confounding variables. And this was uh, significant to two, uh, less than 0.02. I was still skeptical that dry air was related to more infections. So we embarked on another study. Next one, Bert. This is in a senior living facility in Northern Vermont, a really nice uh, high-end place. And again, this study has now been going on over six years. We monitor the indoor environment and correlated those parameters with patient infections. And what we have found, next slide. Once again, and, and really dramatically, um, you can see on the x-axis, we have relative humidity the blue shaded area shows this, uh, what is apparently an optimal indoor relative humidity zone, 40 to 60%. When the indoor humidity was lower than that, you can see, especially with gastrointestinal and respiratory infections, the infection rate was high, both with viral and bacterial illnesses. The green line that trends upward is um, our urinary tract infections, which are really more related to hygiene and mobility. But other than UTIs, you can see that the, the infection rate trended downward as the humidity rose. So these are, these are great um, correlation studies, but we can't really talk about causation because we didn't have a parallel control. But in the next slide, this is a study that was done by the Mayo Clinic in Northern uh, Minnesota in the winter time. So bring in cold outdoor air to this preschool, warm it up to comfort, for temperatures, and unless you humidify, the indoor relative humidity plummets. So they humidified half the school to 45% relative humidity and let the other half of the school do what it, it does. And they actually repeated this in four more schools, with the same results. They found that in the humidified part of the school, you can see in the left second from the left column, the number of airborne particles carrying influenza, this was specifically about influenza, there were fewer infectious particles in the air in the humidified part of the school. And if you go over one more category, this it's really interesting. The, not only were there fewer viral particles, but the ones that were there were less infectious in the humidified part of the school. And not surprisingly, there were fewer children who missed school um, in the humidified classrooms. So this is a great study because it begins to point to causation. Next slide. So that was influenza. What about coronavirus? So this is a laboratory study that was done by Van Dorl and came out in the New England Journal of Medicine in uh, May, 2020, looking at the decay or the inactivation of coronavirus at different relative humidity zones. And you can see here, the, the top black line um, are cold temperatures, the blue line are comfortable temperatures, and the red line is, is way too hot. But at all of these temperature scales, when the relative humidity was between 40 and 60%, you had the fastest inactivation of the coronavirus. So this is, again, a very interesting uh, and I think important finding. Next slide. Okay, so we've talked about the middle column you know, by, by using human health as a lens to the building, we can, we can really begin to reveal some strategies that specifically support human health. But what about this third category? Does the indoor environment affect our health, affect our immunity um, per se? Well, actually, and I know I sound, like, I sound like a humidifier salesperson, but I'm not. I don't sell humidifiers and I don't really even know a lot about the technology, so. If you're thinking that, put it out of your mind, please. But we now know, take a uh, next slide, please. Ever since um, this study came out in the PNAS, Proceedings of the National Academy of Science in May of 2019, we've now learned that one of the reasons that we get, the, we get viral infections in, in the wintertime in temperate climates is you know, it's not just crowding or melatonin or vitamin D that changes in the winter time, but it's low relative humidity indoors, which is critical to making humans vulnerable to infections. 
So this study done at Yale um, used genetically engineered mice. They were engineered so their immune system was similar to humans in response to viral, um, viral microbes. And Dr. Iwasaki and her postdocs found that the your respiratory immune system is affected by the degree of water vapor in the air. The next slide. So if you take a look at how our body protects us, how we have a natural inborn protection against respiratory infections. If that woman comes into your home, she's coughing infectious droplets into your, into your living room, you run the risk of inhaling those. Next click, Bert. So your body has a couple of strategies to, to help you not get sick. One, we have a layer of mucus from our nose, back of our throat, our upper respiratory system that's very sticky and it traps particles. And within that layer of mucus are these little hairs called cilia that are constantly washing upwards at something like 200 beats per minute to, to help, help our lungs not encounter inhaled particles. And furthermore, next click, we have other strategies in our upper respiratory system um, called uh, innate immunity, meaning it's always there. We don't have to have a vaccination to receive that protection. Next click, Bert. We have cells in our, again, our, our back of our throat, our nasopharynx, our oropharynx, our trachea, bronchial tubes, and the cells lining the, our airways actually synthesize um, proteins such as interferon. The cells are macrophages and dendritic cells. And those cells actually synthesize protective proteins such as interferon. And the, the protective proteins help limit infection, limit inflammation. And if it does occur, they help our bodies heal more quickly. Next click. And if necessary, if that doesn't take care of the microbe, um, the 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 innate immunity, our innate immune system then triggers our adaptive immune system. So that's further protection. So these are all things that are built into our body naturally. And next click. And Dr. Iwasaki and her, uh, her rest of her research group found that when the indoor humidity was low at 20%, all of these steps are impaired and they're optimized at 50% relative humidity. So not only is the mucus in your airways well hydrated, it's appropriately sticky, the cilia can work. That's kind of intuitive, but they also found that, that the respiratory epithelial cells don't produce the protective proteins when the air is dry. So this is a, this is a finding that has huge implications because if it's true with other barriers such as our skin barrier, it's just another, it's another dimension of how important the indoor air is in protecting our health. So again, dry air harms our respiratory immune system. Properly humidified air, 40 to 60% optimizes our own natural immunity. Next slide. So those studies are great uh, and they're very informative. However, they're very labor intensive um, and they're only in specific buildings or in a laboratory. This study, which I've been working on with uh, these colleagues from MIT, really takes, um, we try to take the approach of using human health to assess the environment at a much broader scale. So this paper is in, is in publication purgatory right now. We're having some disagreements among us, us authors about where to send it. I'm happy to send you the paper, um, but it's not yet out in press. So we were asking why, next click, Bert. We, we asked why early on with COVID-19, were we seeing outbreaks along certain uh, global latitudes? So we, that was our question, what's going on? Next click. So to begin to look at that question at scale, we took, um, we used public, public data feeds from these three uh, buckets. So government policy, public health measures. So you can see in the upper left, all of the different uh, data inputs that we had. Then uh, in the middle on the right, we looked at demographics, socioeconomics and, and SARS-CoV-2 testing capability. 
And then thirdly, we looked at the ambient, outdoor, and indoor environmental variables. So we put a massive amount of data into our MIT um, statistician machine. And these, uh, the, the MIT group was determined to show that there was no correlation. I don't know if they were just being obstreperous or what, but they're like, nope, we are gonna disprove your hypothesis. So next slide, which is actually not a bad attitude when you're doing a study. So they, they analyze these data buckets, um, you know, on and on and on and on. Neural, neural network analysis, forest, random forest analysis, supervised machine learning, unsupervised machine learning. So finally they, they cried uncle and said, okay, you know, actually there is an association between the environment and new cases and deaths. Next slide. What they found, they said the most powerful correlation is when the indoor relative humidity, both calculated and directly measured in buildings was between 40 and 60 across the globe, Northern hemisphere, Southern hemisphere and equatorial countries. We had the fewest number of, there was about a 10 day lag, but that was determined in the statistics between daily new cases and daily deaths. So again, if you, if you think about this and you think about all of these economic and governmental mandates were in place, and of all of those things that we tested, um, the indoor environment turned out to be the most consequential. It's incredible, I think. Next slide. So is this just true for influenza and coronavirus? Is, it, is this relative humidity zone only applicable to a, you know, certain respiratory viruses? The answer to that is no. We're finding that if you take, uh, this is a graphic style borrowed from Sterling Avondale, 1985 in the ASHRAE handbook. But if you look at all these different categories of viruses and bacteria on the, on the left-hand side, and you input the studies that have been done on human health, so patient healing, uh, academic performance, productivity, we're, what's being revealed it is this 40 to 60% zone, relative humidity zone, where humans are healthiest and we have the, the, least, um, the least number of pathogenic microbes. We still have the good ones, the ones that we need for our health, but the, the infectious ones are diminished in that mid-range 40 to 60% humidity. So when I wake up in the middle of the night thinking about this, I think, you know, maybe this is mother nature giving us humans, you know, we don't evolve that quickly. Um, our immune system can't, can't evolve as quickly as microbes can. So maybe mother nature gave us this certain zone to say, here you go, go humans, here's your chance to survive. And when we're outdoors, even when it's very cold or in Arizona where it's warm, the relative humidity is often, is often in this uh, 40 to 60% zone. So if you think about Arizona in the summertime, I grew up in Tucson, you know, it's hot and dry outdoors, but as soon as you go into the shade or into a building, even if you don't have evaporative air conditioning, as the temperature comes down just from lack of solar radiation, the relative humidity approaches the healthy zone. But it's really in these in sealed buildings with great mechanical heating systems that we have this disconnect between temperature and humidity. So I think that we have, because we don't have sensors for water vapor in our skin, I think we've overlooked this very critical component of our indoor environment. Next slide, I'm almost done. So again, how do we scale this um, beyond the MIT approach? Uh, how do we scale it in a way that's useful for each of our buildings? So we know how to manage office buildings, how to manage our homes. You know, in some climates, you cannot reach 40% relative humidity. It's in, in, uh, in the middle of the winter, you know, unless you have a brand new building with, with optimal building envelopes and insulation, et cetera. So what do we do with our average building so that we know we're doing the best we can for human health? So next slide, Bert. So the question we're asking is how do we know if we're doing the right thing for our, our family members or for ourselves from the perspective of health? 
and Scott's going to talk more about this in the in a minute. Next one, Bert, please. You know, so as a, as a member of the ASHRAE Epidemic Task Force, you know, we're, we're recommending all sorts of things. And Jane made reference to our website. And ASHRAE is great, but ASHRAE is really based on uh, building metrics. It's based on, you know, the movement of carbon particles, uh, energy conservation. You know, as ASHRAE itself says, we are not in the business of testing and balancing for humans. We test and balance mechanical equipment. So what do you do with these recommendations? You know, outdoor air ventilation, sunlight. Do you use UVGI? Do you use bipolar, hydrogen peroxide, MERV-13 filters, mid-range humidity? How do you know where you're starting and how do you know where to stop? I mean, a lot of buildings are already in, in very good shape. Next slide, please. So what we, what the challenge in, as I see it, the challenge that we're faced with now is how do we move from these more traditional building performance metrics that are based on you know, shelters, so clearly we have fire codes, we have seismic codes, uh, energy conservation, we, wanna, we don't wanna cause more pollution, more issues from uh, excess fossil fuel use. And of course we wanna build and manage buildings so that they look great and, are, and have high value. But now, next click, Bert, so what we really need to do now, in my opinion anyway, is, is make, as Jane beautiful, said so beautifully, make visible these other components that are key for human health. Particle levels, you know, which relate to infectious microbial counts, which have a direct impact on our health. Exposure to toxins, so OSHA, uh, VOCs, and inorganic compounds. And then thermal conditions that directly affect our body. We need to bring monitoring of these components uh, into our building so we can actually see where we are. Next slide. So my new company, Building for Health, um, is, is doing that. We have, a, 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 you know, we monitor 10 different parameters that relate to our, your immune function, relate to uh, physiology, relate to what's known about particles and VOCs puts them together so that we have a report card for your building that's based on health. And I believe that Scott is gonna talk about some of their ways to do, um, to monitor buildings. So it's really exciting to think about what we can learn from managing indoor air for human health. Next slide, and I promise you I'm almost done. If you think you're gonna spend a ton of energy on doing, on managing your building for human health, you don't have to. You know, and, and if you can't, you can't, but there's strategies to keep your energy consumption low and optimize your indoor environment. And this is an article I wrote with Mike Schofield and Pat Graff that came out in Ashbury um, last September of 2020. Next slide. You know, so what, because why do we even have buildings? Yes, you know, we need to be sheltered and you know if that if you're successful in being sheltered because if your building falls down on top of you, it has it is not doing its job. Prior to COVID-19, our focus has really been on sustainability. How do you monitor that? We have an energy meeting running and you have to pay for whatever the output is. So now our challenge is, is seeing and supporting buildings for occupant health. And I think we need to do that through human health studies and through monitoring. Next slide. Let's just keep going, please. So we've talked about kind of a lot, um, even with a big Zoom glitch. So thank you for your attention. And next slide, Bert. So I just wanted to show you my cute dog, Luigi, who's under my desk. And uh, I say thank you very much. I hope I didn't massacre the schedule. No, it's fine. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Um, and I would just like to ask everybody to please uh, enter into the chat your questions and we will address questions at the end of uh, Scott's presentation. Um, I'm gonna just put up a couple, a couple more uh, slides here and then have, have Scott start. And I wanted to tell you, I'm just 
extremely uh, happy that Scott from Onset here, a member of our Cape Cod Tech Council uh, company here on Cape Cod Onset Computing. I'm so glad that he's able to join us because um, I think one of the real frustrating things we've all been through during this pandemic is our isolation. We can't invite friends over, we can't get together in church. And this is a, a CNN story about uh, people who were pretty determined to stay together and, and get to their gym uh, to help get through the, uh, the mental frustration and the isolation uh, during the pandemic. Uh, you can see in this picture from the CNN article that an onset uh, monitoring device is featured. And behind it, you can see a gym that has doors open to the outside. And it happens to be the gym in uh, the Western part of Virginia where Lindsay Marr, who's a professor of civil engineering and an expert in indoor air quality was a member. And prior to this episode, she'd helped the owner of the gym figure out how to get better indoor uh, ventilation and open the garage door uh, ventilation options that they had and move their training equipment further apart and then use one of the onset uh, carbon dioxide monitor, uh, monitors that measures carbon dioxide among other things, but using carbon dioxide as a, as a placeholder for adequate ventilation, they actually had none of the 50 athletes that this personal trainer had worked with when he was pre-symptomatic, none of them got sick. So the power of proper indoor air uh, ventilation and then the other things that Stephanie mentioned, filtration and, and so forth, can, can keep you healthy and can allow us to get together uh, indoors again once this pandemic is over. So uh, um, again, we want to make the invisible visible. We want to have Scott tell us in more detail uh, how we can measure uh, the indoor air environment by going through uh, some of the opportunities that uh, that his company can provide us with. And, and just another uh, uh, cartoon that I thought was wonderful in an NPR article is how super cautious experts guard against COVID. They basically try to make the indoors more like the outdoors. So I'm gonna turn it over to Scott and uh, thank you very much for, um, for, for joining us, Scott. Take it away. Yeah, no, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate being here. Uh, oop. Okay, am I up? Um, not can yet. You, you, I can hear you. I can't see your slides. Okay, let me get the slides up here. Hang on one second. Uh, share. All right, how's that? That's good. All That's right. Good. There we go. Perfect. So, uh, yeah, thank you again for, for joining us today. This is really, uh, you know, beneficial for, for my side of things, too. You know, obviously, uh, with everything that's going on, um, you know, here at, at Onset Computer, a little bit, I guess, about myself. I've been with the company now for about 24 years. Uh, I actually grew up on the Cape, uh, decided to leave for a while because that's what you do when you're a kid. And then, uh, <clears throat> you know, Cape Cod's actually one of the nicer places around the country, in my per in, in my opinion, and I uh, ended up making a home back here, and uh, you know found this nice little uh, tech company to work for, and it's been interesting to watch the company grow up. Um, now in its 40th year, uh, you know since since being out there and and seeing the products evolve and and how they affect not just indoor air quality. Um, but we measure all sorts of things, weather, uh, underwater parameters. So, so really, you know, being able to record things that will help, uh, you know, essentially save the environment, whether that's uh, inside or, or outside. So let me just dive into this here. So one of the questions is, is what was your building originally designed for? Uh, we know that a lot of the buildings on the Cape here may have been put up at one point and now they're repurposed. Were you once a shopping mall? Well, Onset was. 75% <laughs> um, of the buildings in the US are gonna be repurposed as opposed to just knocking them down and uh, uh, building them back up. So if you remember on MacArthur's Boulevard back in the mid eighties, there was a shopping mall that got put up there, which failed. 
And you can see the red lines uh, on here. And then these boxes are all the HVAC units. And they were set up for each individual store and kind of looking at, at both part of our buildings at, at this point. Um, now the shopping mall, it moved to a different location. It's up near the bridge now. That has actually transformed over the years as well. There's a number of businesses there uh, that, are, that are empty at this point, but getting back to our building, you know, we basically have two buildings that are 25,000 square feet each and they're joined uh, by a hallway. One side now has an open floor plan where all of our manufacturing is done, which is the building across the bottom. And then the other side is pretty much wide open. There's a couple walls. Uh, there's a couple three quarter walls or half walls, uh, but it's mainly cubicle city at the end of the day. So we have a, a, an open floor plan there. So, you know, some of the challenges that, that we've had um, is, you know, and I saw somebody mention this earlier, there's a cost involved in this anytime that you're looking to transform a building. And so a, a lot of buildings that you'll find too that under 100,000 square feet may not have a full blown control system in place. I'd say what we have now is sort of a partial control uh, that's mainly being pulled off of, off of temperature and looking at, at some humidity controls. Um, and you set your temperature st uh, setback strategies and, and things along those lines. Um, but there are things that we obviously do need to monitor, uh, you know, in the building to make sure that it is, it is going to be healthy because the majority of us right now are working from home like most, uh, but our manufacturing folks are still in the building and when, if they let us back, um, <laughs> you know, it'll be important to have a, a healthy environment there moving forward. So your comfort, um, there's, there's many different things that, that come into play when you're dealing with your, your comfort within a building, um, whether it's water quality, lighting, uh, odor, um, you know, looking at, at air quality is, is probably one of the higher ones. Um, obviously, you know, you, a lot of places are dealing with mold in some cases, buildings that may have been closed up for a long period of time. I know that's certainly a concern of our school buildings that have been closed or the, the dorms that have been closed at, at universities for length, lengthy periods of time. Um, you know, one of the biggest takeaways is just because there aren't people in the building doesn't mean that you can't ignore the building. You need to treat it a little differently because you may not have all of the uh, people in there, you know, affecting the indoor air quality, but those buildings still need to be treated. So as you go through this, um, you kind of need to go through and, and one, make the case, you know, do, do you want to go in and, and make changes? Is your building, does your building need changes? So you need to uh, develop your plan, walk through and assess it, um, look at the, the indoor uh, air quality technical solutions, and then basically staffing and communication. And, and that's a lot what, um, uh, Stephanie had presented in, in her presentations. They identified it, put together a plan, they recorded the data, they were able to analyze the data, and I, I love, I, I wrote this down, the data doesn't lie. Um, <laughs> you know, as, as much as you run it through all these statistical programs and everything, at the end of the day, what you're recording is really going to tell you uh, what is going on in the building. And then from there, that needs to be communicated to the people who are coming into the building. Are we going to be changing things? Um, is there a different way, uh, you know, in terms of how the, the building's going to be operating? So, and, and even a visual representation sometimes is good. So having a dashboard, you can walk in. Uh, one of the articles um, was, I think it was either Japan or Taiwan, and they were having one of these, uh, you know, uh, American Idol type, um, uh, programs on and on the side of the stage on probably an 84 inch uh, TV screen is they were monitoring the indoor air quality and it was either set to green, red, um, or yellow to tell you what the what the air quality was within that particular space where all these people were performing. So, you know, that may be something that uh, folks will use moving forward. 
I found it interesting, uh, Stephanie, you had a very similar image and, and um, all these things are really uh, tied together. Um, you know, really kind of looking at energy efficiency, um, you know, and, and looking at the ASHRAE guidelines, there are some recommendations that honestly is going to increase your energy, energy efficiency during this time where they're recommending uh, starting up your air conditioning or heating system two hours before and then letting it run for two hours afterwards. Um, again, doing monitoring to understand how much uh, fresh air is in your building will help you uh, define and redefine how much energy you're actually using uh, in that particular space. That CNN article is a great, um, you know, great example of that, where that particular building was clearly, and, and you can Google them and, and, and take a look at the gym, but it was, that building was clearly designed as a gym. It has open bays. Uh, I want to say there was at least eight to 10 uh, different openings. So they had tons of airflow going through. Uh, but if you think about uh, the gym that used to be in East Falmouth, which is now closed, uh, that I went to many, many moons ago, but they just had small windows in there. Ventilation wasn't very good. You walked in there during the summertime and it felt like a sauna. Um, so, you know, those are some things that, uh, you know, we're going to be able to monitor using some of these tools. Charts, lots of information here. Uh, it boils down to, and I know this does have a, a wider humidity range of 20 to 80%, but this is more talking about human comfort as opposed to the spread of, of, of uh, the viruses. And there's a lot of different things that take into account and you can stick it into your formulas and come out with anything. But you know, at the end of the day, it's all about science, right? Yay, science. Um, so let's take a look at some of the tools of the trade. A handheld meter or display. Um, this is, I, I refer to this as a simple photograph. It's a snapshot in time. You're gonna be able to take a look at this. Uh, it, it'll tell you a thousand words of what is going on, but it's only gonna tell you at that particular point when you looked at it and how you interpret that data, which may be perfectly fine. There's many folks that um, will use these monitors. They may write it down on a piece of paper to sort of keep a log, the old uh, pen and paper log. Um, but then there's other uh, devices that are called data loggers. And so I refer to this as more of like a video. It's gonna capture something. It's gonna tell you something that's happened over a period of time, whether that's a day, whether that's a month, whether that's a year, whether that's multiple years. Um, a, a data logger is gonna store the information. They're typically battery operated. Uh, they typically have X amount of memory on them. Uh, some of them will actually uh, stream to the internet nowadays, um, but others you just download through a USB port or offload through Bluetooth, and you can essentially see what has happened over a particular period of time. Building automation systems, I'm not going to even touch on this, but this takes it totally next level. It gets into all the different controls, peaks and valleys. If this, then that happens. Um, it just takes the controls to a, to a whole nother level, uh, even to the point where, uh, depending upon the CO2 levels, you may have a damper control system that allows more fresh air in. Uh, it may be getting conditioned differently. Um, if you have a building automation system, um, you're probably using that to, to your benefit to be able to control the particular environment. And you may be using tools like handheld ray guns or data loggers to look at particular trouble spots. We always uh, work with that coworker who's either too hot or too cold. I will admit I put on shorts in March and take them off in November. So um, that's kind of my viewpoint there. Um, and then, and then we have the internet of things, you know, the, the world has changed so dramatically, especially over the past five years where everything's connected now. Um, you know, you go down to the Shaw's and your refrigerator texts you that you need some more milk. It's, it's really kind of crazy where, where things have gotten, but that also makes it um, more accessible. Uh, I, I had, uh, we had, we had taken off for a couple of days and I was actually able to log in and, and make sure that, you know, when I had set back the temperature when we left, the house was actually doing what it was supposed to be doing. 
So taking uh, things to look for when you're, when you're looking for some of the tools, and I will make a couple of recommendations, but what I found is that there's just so many things to look for. I, I, I spent some time on Google, which I ended up at Amazon, where you can find just hundreds of data loggers or displays or things that will measure uh, total VOCs, um, particulates, uh, getting into CO2, uh, carbon monoxide, CO, uh, and temperature and relative humidity. Uh, you'll find, at least we've found in our past 40 years, that there's been many competitors that have come out into the data logging business. So um, the perception out there is low cost is cheap, high, high cost is quality. That's not always the case. Um, our data loggers specifically, they start around $50. Uh, and, and in a lot of cases, we've seen customers who use these for years upon years upon years, and you can test those to a particular uh, standard as well. So we do understand that everybody needs to work within a budget, and you're not going to go spend a ton of money if you can't convince the bean counters. Um, and, and that's where you may need to take some of these steps to assess beforehand if you're going to take over you know, and, and, and actually, you know, work with somebody like Cape Lake Compact. And well, they do offer uh, free building assessments, but based upon that, what are the next steps? Are you going to invest in, in changing your building? One of the things that you want to look for is spe specifications. Um, one of the more frustrating things that I see is at some of the big box stores. Um, I've seen this with some energy meters in the past very cool product that comes out. It's under $200. There's no specifications associated with it whatsoever. Um, you start doing some Googling and you find that folks in the industry will take these things and then go back and try to quantify what the actual specifications are. So as you're reading through the, the, the a particular product that you might be interested, make sure that it actually has a spec. What are the ratings? Do they give you more detailed spec? Is your relative humidity, um, is it uh, plus or minus this uh, over this particular range? Or you know, is there a bell curve, which you're gonna find that most sensors do? Is there an environmental rating? You may hear things called IP67 or IP50 or something called non-condensing. You can't get it wet. And yes, morning dew counts as moisture. Um, I've seen people who have put the, the CO2 loggers outside or underneath an overhang and they're technically not getting wet, but when that milled, no, when that, <laughs> when that morning dew, squirrel, sorry, when that uh, morning dew, uh, you know, collects on the sensor itself, that's gonna add some additional moisture uh, into the mix and can put it into a condensing type environment. Uh, looking at calibration, um, how do you calibrate your CO2 logger or does it just magically work? Uh, similar to our steps, I found an, another competitor who uh, they lay out the steps on how you should, uh, how you should initially um, calibrate the logger before you deploy it. Most gas sensors tend to drift over the course of a week or a couple weeks. So is there an auto calibration feature in there? Um, most of the sensors that uh, I've researched and looked at uh, do have some sort of feature in there, or you may have to just put it outside again every couple of weeks to let it equilibrate to um, most of these are calibrated to 400 parts per million. Now we do know um, that in some areas of the world, uh, specifically Asia, that their normal is higher than that in the 420 to 4. Uh, 50 range. So there may have to be a, a different type of offset there. Power. Uh, is the device battery operated or is it AC power? Look at the specs. Is it designed to work on a battery or is the battery specifically there as a backup? In many of these cases, especially when you're starting to talk about gas sensors, they're very power hungry. And most cases, these do need to be plugged in. So look and see what the battery actually means. Is it six hours to 72 hours as a backup? Or looking at the battery life, how is it actually specified? Can the logger or the instrument record, say, every five minutes and run for six months? 
Or does somebody say, hey, ours runs for 10 years. What does that actually mean? Well, it can only run four times a day. It can only take a reading four times a day. So those are some things to, to take a look at. Um, many of the uh, CO2 sensors that you're gonna find uh, do need to be uh, AC powered somehow. Um, again, things to take into consideration. You may want to monitor uh, centrally located within a particular room, maybe, uh, or at the front of a classroom or off to the side. Um, you need to take into consideration, are you gonna to need to run extension cords? How do you get power to that unit um, to make sure that it, uh, you know, that it, that it runs for the, the amount of time? And, and it could be a short period of time, you know, whether that's a week or two to understand what normal activity is, even though I'll say right now, nothing's normal. Uh, well, some of the schools are here on the cable. They, you know, they, they are having more, more kids coming back in. So you can see that. Uh, memory, things to look for. How long will something record for? Is there a number of measurements? Does it take an SD card? There are some devices out there, especially when we're talking about monitors and displays that only show the min, max, and the current reading, the daily min and max. There are some that needed to be connected to the computer all the time in order to get that trend data. Um, so again, as, as you're looking at some of these things, I, I do recommend just looking at a manual. And, and in most cases, um, even on Amazon, actually, they, they do tell you how the product works. And if you can't find something, um, like what I've done in many cases is, um, uh, taking the, the name of the manufacturer and the part number and Googling that, and you can usually do a little more digging. So this was a, I, I gave a webinar uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I, I thought this kind of applied to, to, to here. And, you know, what, what, how, how and where should I place them looking in attics and crawl spaces? And what are the best data logger placements for residential homes? And you know, it really depends upon the space uh, that you're trying uh, to do the monitoring. Uh, typically, a data logger can cover about 2,500 square feet. Um, I included this example here because there's so many different areas within a residential home that you could do monitoring. Now, at a minimum, I, I do monitoring here mainly because, well, we make the hobos, so I have a lot of them. Um, but uh, at a minimum, I'd record at the thermostats. Uh, you know, it was interesting. My, my parents' house, which was built in the, the late 1800s and up until about five years ago, they still had one of the old school dial mercury uh, thermostats. And my mother was complaining that it never got up the temperature. And when we went over and we stuck a data logger on it for the day, um, it was showing that it was four to five degrees off. So, you know, if you still have those in your home, uh, call Cape Lake Compact. They'll give you a discount towards some of the new thermostats, um, whether it's just simply, simply a five or seven day programmable thermostat, or if you go full blown to the Google uh, Nest thermostats, the smart thermostats that, that um, and, and those particular thermostats do actually uh, tell you relative humidity as well, whereas just the programmable ones typically do not. Now, how do we apply that 2,500 square foot to an office building or larger facilities? Uh, this is a great example of the, of the onset building at this point where it's wide open. Uh, you can see where the ventilation, uh, where the ceiling vents are. Um, you, can, you can start to see where the windows are. Are there any outside influences that, that may affect uh, the temperature or, or CO2 in that room? Um, of course, you know, you do get complaints sometimes where somebody may be sitting, they're against a cement wall, uh, their feet might be cold for, you know, different reasons. Um, you can certainly see sometimes a three to four degree difference between the floor underneath somebody's desk and to the thermostat. Now, at the end of the day, you're not going to be able to solve everybody's problems. That's just the way that the buildings are. But you, know, you are going to want to do some monitoring to make sure at least the system that you do have, again, whether it's just simple thermostat control or a, a full building automation system is running properly. Uh, and just one more example, I, I wanted to show this because 
Um, this is a, a, you may monitor this particular building a little differently where there's more enclosed spaces um, so that the person sitting in the fir first office may have a different comfort level than in the second office. And a lot of that has to do with uh, where, the, where the ducts go, where the air ducts go. We, um, we famously in our building put up a, a uh, new conference room at the, the back of, of one of our bays and uh, it contains the heating vent. Uh, that conference room regularly sees about 82 degrees. Um, so, you know, again, we, we probably could have put the conference room or moved the ductwork, uh, you know, done that a little better, but, you know, those are, those are lessons learned and things to take into account as if you are going into a new building and repurposing it. So uh, one of the applications here, um, it again, comes back to uh, temperature, humidity, and CO2. Um, in an office or a manufacturing environment, the visual display, uh, this will also give you an audible alarm. So uh, if it does go outside of range, uh, you can have a beeping there. There are other manufacturers that actually change the color, like I mentioned before, on that, that large TV. But depending upon uh, you know, what the, the different parameters are, you may see that obviously in the room on the left, if you're maintaining under a thousand parts per million, that's fantastic. You've got great ventilation in there. If you're looking at the room on the right uh, and you're at a thousand parts per million with just two people in there, that's not good ventilation. So you know, keep in mind that every room is different. Um, and it depends upon what the airflow is and what the demand system uh, you know, may be providing in terms of fresh air. So you know, while, while sensor placement is, is important, um, it, it's, you know, it's definitely important to uh, collect all of the measurements as well. And then for and again, it goes back to the office environments, having these in each of the locations. Now, I, I think for our office, when we go back, uh, you know, we have what I would define as, as two large conference rooms, and then uh, probably about six other conference rooms that are anywhere from a 15 by 15 to a 10 by 10 to a 20 by 20 room. And I think those are things that we're gonna wanna look at, because uh, I do know when you crowd, you know, 25, 30, sales and tech support people into one room, uh, you know, obviously your CO2 levels are going to go up, the ventilation goes down. And uh, after listening to somebody like myself talk for 45 minutes, I've probably put them to sleep. So uh, you'll want to make sure that you are pumping fresh air uh, into those areas. And I just want to leave you with a couple suggestions. Um, for some of the, the loggers that are out there. Um, there, was a, there was a study done out of Europe that actually uh, went in, in, in pretty well in depth uh, into 10 different types of CO2 and VOC loggers and uh, compared them against standards. And it ranges from the, the, the products that you see here. So the, the Hobo logger, as well as uh, there's a company uh, that offers, it's called CO2 meter. Um, the one on the right is, is just a display. Uh, the one on the left actually uh, is a logger. I, I believe they have uh, minimum, uh, minimum capabilities. Uh, and, and actually, Jane, I didn't include the one uh, that you offer, but that's also from, or that you're using from, from CO2 meter, uh, which is also a data logger. In, in terms of a price range, you're typically looking uh, at the CO2 loggers are gonna run about the 150 to upwards, our particular logger is $600. So um, it, it depends upon a lot of the capabilities. Ours is battery operated where some of the others are, you do need to plug them into a wall. So um, what I'd like to do is, is uh, just kind of give you my contact information here. If you do have any questions or, or want to reach out or, you know, have any questions that you may find, um, 
you know, at, as you're searching for uh, data loggers or tools that you could find, you know, that, that, that you may be looking for to look to monitor uh, your indoor air quality. And, uh, let me turn this back over to, I'll turn this back over to you, Jane. Thank you, Scott and Stephanie, both. Um, we have a lot of great questions and um, I want to, uh, let's see. I wanted to go back to this particular uh, cartoon that I put up. I think that if you're like me, when I first got into this whole, how do we manage air quality indoors? If we got into this area, um, I was overwhelmed. And I thought, oh my gosh, it's, it's either expensive or complicated or you have to be an engineer. Well, I think what I would like to ask uh, both Stephanie and Scott is what, what can we do as first steps? And Stephanie, maybe if we could go back to one of the slides near the end of your talk where you kind of summarize the different approaches that, that Ashri um, mentions to people where in addition to, measure, to maintaining um, or acquiring the, the appropriate relative humidity indoors, what are some of the basics in terms of addressing our HVAC system or however we're heating and cooling our houses? Uh, and how can we do some simple things? In this cartoon, they talk about, just keep in mind the principle of making the indoors more like the outdoors. Opening windows and running a, a fan in the window can do a lot. Using your exhaust fans can do a lot. Um, so I would like to uh, maybe have, have Stephanie start by answering that question and then, and then go to Scott and just talk about just basically evaluating and uh, ensuring optimization of the HVAC system that we currently have. Great question, Jane. You know, so when this all started back, um, well, when we moved into the summer, when Ashray really came on board with recommendations, we were saying, ventilation, ventilation, ventilation. So it was all dilutional, you know, dilute your indoor air with outdoor air and you'll dilute any bad stuff indoors. You know, that works better in the summertime. And then, you know, wintertime comes and we're now recommending, you know, yes, do ventilate for dilutional control, but we were, you know, most buildings are gonna have to recirculate air. So put in MERV 13 filters, um, humidify, although ASHRAE's, you know, the recommendations about humidity are, are less clear, although in the epidemic task force, we all advocate for it. Um, then unfortunately, there's a little more murkiness around germicidal technology and, and looking for peer reviewed studies. UVC uh, lights, I think are valuable in ducts or in upper air systems. UVC should not hit human skin because it's toxic to us. UVC, I think, can be a really good technology. I don't think we can use it, you know, 24 hours a day in all buildings because we're also seeing some mutation signatures that are uh, that make us ask the question: Is UVC also promoting uh, mutagenesis? Having said that, no technology should be should be used all the time. Um, without, without worrying about the long-term consequences. So we, I think UVC is very good and very helpful and we just need to keep our eye on long-term consequences. What about bipolar ionization? So ASHRAE, we are actually staying away from that right now, not because we don't think it's useful, but because we don't have enough peer-reviewed studies showing the efficacy of bipolar. So, you know, I'm trying to wear both my ASHRAE hat and my personal knowledge hat. Um, myself, what do I say? I say humidify your buildings. My husband and I live in Stowe, Vermont, and we started humidifying four years ago. My husband used to get sick every single winter. He was in the Air Force and he inhaled something or another. It didn't help his lungs. So we, we have an evaporative and a steam humidifier. Works great. The other thing, if you want to improve your indoor microbiome, and this isn't just my theory, get a dog. Cuddle with your dog, hug your dog, kiss your dog. It's not quite the same with cats. They have some different antigens that are not as robustly healthy for humans. I would say open your windows to the extent you can. 
Um, use UVC, use bipolar, just be aware of long-term consequences. Filter, humidify, and get a pet. Scott, do you have anything to add in terms of uh, your experience or working with your clients? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely, uh, you know, sim similar to what you're saying, Stephanie, you know, what I'm, what I'm seeing and hearing is that a lot of folks are moving towards the MERV 13 filters. That's probably the easiest thing that, that folks could do right away immediately. Um, but obviously, uh, you know, monitoring in that space and understanding, you know, what the spaces are doing. Um, you know, and then uh, again, working with your facility manager, um, you know, we do know that uh, we had, we had talked with the Boston public school system and it was a little shocking that um, they have 325 schools and they have five building facility managers to run all of those schools. So it's, you know, it's quite a daunting task for a lot of these folks to take on, but the more that you understand what your buildings are doing, the, you know, the better that, that you can start to make these changes and, and um, you know, and, and whether that's, you know, in some cases you may need to pull in a test and balance professional, um, you know, and, and working with, with HVAC professionals out there. Um, but, you know, there are simple tools to get you started so you can at least start to understand your space. Right. I think that's, that's good advice. I, I think depending on the uh, complexity and the size of your building and your budget and what it's to be used for, you do need to figure out how to partner with a building professional, with an ASHRAE engineer or a company that's an expert in this type of work. And I would suggest that. If you want to just uh, you know, make your house into a science experiment, which is kind of what my husband and I have done, <laughs> get one of the entry level uh, CO2 monitors and, and just play with it. And one of the things I think a lot of Scott's equipment and some of the ones he talked about that aren't from his company, they're portable. So you don't have to buy one for every room. You just get one and you know test part of your house or part of your business, small business at a time. You can move it around. Even some of the schools I think that Onset has worked with have bought um, maybe a, a couple dozen of the monitors and they move them around through different classrooms and, and other areas. And then once they've set the ventilation appropriately for that space, they can move them to other areas. So yeah, that's that's okay. actually a great that's a great point. Um, you know, and, and you don't need to go hog wild and invest all this money and monitor every single space in your home. You know, I've I've got uh, way too many loggers here at the house just just because of uh, you know when we came home we brought all the equipment home so we could work with it. But yeah, absolutely. Um, you could section off and say, okay, for this one week, I'm going to look at this particular room or these four classrooms or this particular space, understand what that's going on and then move it. The, the one thing that I will just say is that you, you're looking for spaces that you're seeing consistency from week to week. So if you have a, a lunchroom, for example, and you always have the employees coming in at 10 in the morning for a break or noon or two o'clock in the afternoon, uh, you're going to want to be able to make sure that when you do that monitoring, that same activity is happening as you move the loggers around. But that, that's a great point, Jane. You can, right. you can certainly get started at a very low cost. And I think there's, there's also, um, I would commend for your continuing education in this area, I would commend the ASHRAE website. They have, as I, as I showed in that one picture, you probably didn't get a chance to see it, but this is all recorded. So you can, you can look at everything we've presented um, afterwards and Bert will tell us where to go, what the link will be for the recording. But um, ASHRAE has, has PowerPoints and uh, not just their uh, requirements and guidelines, but they have PowerPoints for each topic, for each type of building, schools, hospitals, uh, homes, uh, transportation sector, whatever. Uh, and you can learn at your own speed from that PowerPoint and then uh, go to the local um, ASHRAE chapter. I think it's uh, Boston and Southeast Mass are, are all one chapter and, and they can give you somebody, if you have a more complex uh, area, they can give you somebody as a, as a reference who can uh, come in our local companies, our local HVAC companies here can give you expertise in terms of evaluating your particular building. Uh, but I would suggest that this is important enough to our health to, for all of us to learn more about it. And it's actually kind of fun.
one, I think. There's another very good resource. The Maine Indoor Air Quality Council is outstanding. They are a combined building public health, clinical health group that got together in Maine in the early 90s. Maine has a huge problem with radon, uh, which is the radioactivity in granite and other um, geologic formations. They have a terrible problem with old buildings with asbestos. Uh, and they started getting into the green building movement in the, in the 90s and had very tight buildings with very poor indoor air and very poor health outcomes. This group is, uh, they have weekly updates that are very uh, understandable. You don't have to be a building professional to understand them. And they have ongoing uh, seminars and webinars that uh, are either very low cost or free to the public. And I would suggest that group as a way to go uh, with your ongoing continuing education. Um, we've had some good, uh, some good questions on the chat. One of them, I think we've covered in terms of the, the UV and the, the HVAC. Um, and uh, Beth Young has asked, why do you need a CO2 sensor and not just a humidity sensor? Do you, uh, either or both of you want to comment on that question? Uh, I'll let Scott take that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, at, at a minimum, you know, humidity is definitely uh, the place to start. Um, you know, that's, I, I think, especially, you know, here on the, on the Cape where, you know, we, we do see a lot of high humidity um, in, in closed off spaces. You know, I go back to my, my neighbor, um, probably about eight, 10 years ago at this point. And um, she had a brand new house built. And within two years, she had to throw out everything in her attic uh, because of black mold. Um, so, you know, humidity is definitely a low cost um, way to start. Uh, CO2, again, starts to show you some of that fresh air uh, that, that you're also bringing into the space. But, um, you know, humidity control is, is, is certainly a, a, a key factor to to monitor and, uh, you know, in my opinion, CO2 is just an added benefit to it. So Scott, I just wanted to add, a lot of people have a misunderstanding about humidity. They think that mold is hygroscopic and, that, and can ex actually extract water vapor from the air for their growth, which is, they cannot do. But if you have a, a thermal channel in your wall or cold pipe in a warm humidified space, you're, you're going to get water activity of 0.8, you're gonna reach a dew point, you're gonna have liquid condensation. And that's when you have mold growth. So I would just encourage people to be aware that creating an indoor Sahara desert is not the way to go. Properly, humidif properly humidify and insulate your building envelope. Don't make it overly tight. You know, it's, we, we know the hazards of that, but don't equate properly humidified buildings with black mold, because that's not right. Um, James, and if you it's do Robin. have mold, oh, if you do have mold, don't dry out the air because then you release the hyphae and spores and you'll have real problems. Sorry. That's, sorry, Stephanie. Uh, Jane, it's Robin. Do you, do you mind if I jump in here for a Go second? Ahead. Go ahead. No. I, just think, I think I understand this the SPO2 question because I, um, I had to do a lot of uh, research and, and education for myself um, because I have a, a bricks and mortar business. And Scott, please correct me if I'm uh, if I'm stating stating this wrong, but <clears throat> the CO2 is not really a factor in uh, COVID or or any in in irritants. The CO2 the reason that there we're measuring CO2 is because if CO2 levels are rising when a bunch of people get into a room, it's an indicator of how well your ventilation system is working. Is that correct? Yeah, that, that's 100% correct. I will state this now. CO2 monitoring does not cure COVID people. It, <laughs> we actually uh, offer that, that, that CNN gym article. Uh, we actually did have a, a couple people call in and, and that was uh, one of the questions that my, my sales rep took was can your CO2 logger cure COVID? Uh, and, and no, that's not the case. And, and um, you know, that, that's a great explanation of it. it. It's really talking about the amount of airflow and the amount of fresh air that, that, that could be in that space. Right, it's a placeholder for the adequate ventilation. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think it's, you know, we, having lived half my uh, Air Force life in Texas, I was very, very sensitive to 
the danger of mold. Um, and one of the ways I got into this field actually was having a house that we had to uh, totally tear out an HVAC system with black mold. And uh, as we were trying to sell it, it, it was closed up between realtor visits. They, they shoved the air conditioning uh, thermostat down and the, the house became like a meat locker and it was covered with black mold. It was one of the worst experiences of my life. So I became very uh, interested and familiar with the opportunity to add a UVC light in your HVAC system. If you have a building with duct work and you have a, a central air conditioning system, you put a UV light over the coils of the air conditioning, you kill the mold that might grow when there's condensate in the pan in that part of your HVAC system. And you can keep the coils uh, clean as the air gets circulated through. But there, this is within a closed HVAC system with ductwork. It's not uh, shining at you in your, in your dining room or whatever. But uh, one of my colleagues was able to have Texas, help Texas A&M save about $22 million. They had a, a, a building for their pharmacy school that was totally uh, uh, turned into a sick building from black mold. And instead of having to tear the building down and rebuild a new building, they were able to bring in room air purifiers that were based on HEPA filters, uh, UV lights, and charcoal filters, run room air purifiers while they tore out and redid the central HVAC system. And then they put better quality filters and UVC in their central system when it was redone. Um, Texas is a terrible place for mold. And I think Cape Cod with a lot of our seasonal buildings or even the buildings that have been closed for months with, with COVID is a horrible place for mold. So I, I'm uh, a bit of a fan of UVC. I think it's just uh, basically a way to bring sunshine indoors. I do think they're, the cautions that Stephanie brought up are appropriate, but I would err on the side of, of uh, using UVC. We've, we've also had a question on do uh, portable air purifiers what are, what are your opinions about portable air purifiers? I'm, I'm a fan, but I think you have to be careful about the particular one you get. Stephanie and Scott, what are, what are your thoughts on if, that? I'll let you take that, Stephanie. Well, um, I think my son had one of those in college because he was smoking stuff. He wasn't supposed to smoke. <laughs> um, and I think you have to be careful about where they are, what technology they use, um, make sure that there are no other health risks involved. So it's kind of hard to answer without knowing what they're using, Jane. Um, yeah. I think I think too that um, you know since this is, has happened, um, you know, in the, in the spring, we're starting to see more universities do longer term studies with this newer technology and look and see what some of the the, the long term effects uh, may may be or, or not to to help prove out some of this stuff. So, you know. We, we certainly see that, you know, you may not recommend using it full time and it may take a couple of years to, to some of these studies to come out, but it is something to continue to watch for. I, I would say UVC is not new technology. It was in 1870s, I believe, or 1890s in, in Pasteur's lab that his uh, lab helpers noticed that the bacteria in the test tubes were killed if they were in the sunshine. And UVC is used widely in water purification. As the water passes by, the, any microbes are killed in water purification. Uh, it's not a new technology. It does have to be uh, applied carefully. In terms of the air purifiers, I would recommend uh, you can go to the, to, the, uh, to the EPA, look for Energy Star uh, purifiers that don't use too much power. And, um, you also want to get one that has a, a high quality filter in it, either a MERV 13 or higher or a HEPA filter. Um, I, I think they, are, they definitely have their place, the, the uh, room air purifiers. Um, if you, uh, Robin, if you see any other uh, questions you think we should jump on to next, please help. Yeah, there's a, there's a few good, really good ones in here. Um, so we got one question here from uh, looks like Pat. Um, the question is, uh, I think she's looking for some advice 
um, on how best to convince administrators of, you know, of big companies with big buildings that factors other than cost and um, factors other than cost are important. So I think um, uh, some people are encountering um, resistance to trying to, uh, you know, improve the indoor air quality because there's not as much uh, understanding of its importance. So uh, what are your thoughts on, on convincing those, um, you know, making the, the business case to the, to the administrators who have, who are, uh, have the decision-making power? Oh my gosh, you know, that's a great question. And I have struggled with that mightily, you know, so I, when I first started my work, I thought, well, once my, you know, hospital administrator colleagues from medical school understand this and they look, they can prevent healthcare associated infections, they'll be all over this idea, not the case. You know, you come into Mass General and say, we can help you with your infection control rate. And they're like, and you can just leave with, along with 60 minutes right now. It's really challenging. And I think the only way around that, and Jane, you know this from the HIBR conference two years ago, we have to prevent financial models, the cost benefit models that include the, the return on investment of a healthy human being. And it's, it's not easy to do. But you're right, if you just look at energy or you just look at other things, managing your building for these invisible factors uh, is a hard, is a difficult sell, even in hospitals. So I think, um, I think really educating, having conferences like this and, you know, COVID-19 has probably done more to convince people about the importance of building management for health than anything else. It's kind of the silver lining of this pandemic, in my opinion. Stephanie, actually, actually, a question for you, Stephanie. Um, now, I, I know there's been a lot written up over the years about sick building syndromes. Um, it is, and there's been a lot of studies in the past. Do you think that some of that information could then, you know, help the return on investment of a, a life, essentially, or some of those studies be used in, in this particular well, Scott, you're gonna You're going to love my answer because you know, sick building syndrome is based on things that we can perceive. So, yeah. you know, odors or whether you have a headache, but a lot of what influences health, both acutely and more chronically are things that aren't visible, such as humidity, such as particles. So I think that the concept of a sick building syndrome, that concept is helpful, but I really believe we need studies using monitoring such as your uh, technology and we need to not only involve ASHRAE and health and engineering and building professionals, but medical professionals. Because if you're talking about the intersection of health and the indoor environment, you know, you got to include the medical professionals. And unlike Jane and unlike me, most medical professionals are not willing to go outside their area of expertise. So it's challenging. I would say that one of the best uh, books I've come across or, or, or experts experts uh, for return on investment is Joe Allen from Harvard. Yeah. He partners with uh, building finance people from Harvard yeah. Business School, and he's published the book that Stephanie's holding up that <laughs> talks about how if you make your indoor air environment, including your indoor air quality, but if you make your indoor air uh, environment healthier with the good, with the good air, uh, the, the good ventilation, um, filtration, indoor lighting that's close to outdoor lighting, natural lighting, you can reduce the most expensive part of your business is your people. Yeah. Uh, and the most important thing in your education is your students. So if you reduce absenteeism and you reduce, uh, you know, health, uh, health problems in your personnel, they have very convincing studies about how you get about a 10 to one, I believe, return on investment if you address those issues in a, in a, a corporate building, office building, or a school uh, in terms of reducing absentee days in your students and staff or in your workers. And um, I would highly commend following Joe Allen. He has a number of uh, uh, articles and webinars that are on, online, and that book is outstanding. That's a really good way to address the return on investment, I think, one of the better ones I've seen. But the, the people at Texas A&M totally believed that it was a savings. It would have been $22 million to rebuild that building. And for something like um, 
I think it was under 100,000 redoing the ventilation system and treating the mold. So they had quite a savings there, you know, over 21 million savings by making it a healthy building. The other, another, another reference I'd like to point people to, which I think is great, was done by the GSA, which I didn't know what that was until a couple of years ago, General Services Administration. And it's in indoor, it's in the publication, Indoor Air 20. 20, let's see, Indoor Air 2020, and it came out in January. And in this study, they monitored all these indoor factors and human physiology and looked at productivity and fatigue. Right. And surprisingly, they found that relative humidity was really important and that if you properly humidify your office during the day, people sleep better at night. And we now know a little bit more about humidity and cortisol production. But anyway, Indoor Air 2020. I would say that for the questions that we haven't gotten to, um, I'm happy to try to field those afterwards. I know we're, we're about ready to, to wind up here, um, but please, um, I can, Bert can share the, the uh, questions with me. And if I have emails, I can get back to people uh, if your questions weren't addressed. Um, but um, we're, we only have a, a minute or two left. Uh, Robin, is there another question that you think we should cover in that last minute? Um, yeah, I'd like to. I'd like to just ask uh, the panelists if you could just please. We've touched on uh, a number of different things here, but if maybe somebody could just do a, a sort of basic 101 compare and contrast of UV versus HEPA versus MERV. Um, I think those are those are three filtering uh, measurements or, or concepts that uh, we talk a lot about. But I'm not sure we all understand exactly what the difference is between the three. So MERV is middle efficiency um, filtration. So, and then HEPA is high efficiency filtration. And then UVC is ultraviolet light in the C wavelength is that er irradiates and eradicates or kills organisms. So the UVC is a little bit different, but I would say humidify and put in MERV, MERV for 13. Um, for your, so you don't have too big a pressure drop across your filtration and then use UVC in your ductwork. So some, some, um, some HVAC systems apparently cannot handle MERV 13 without significant okay. degradation of performance. Um, so um, you know, my system, for example, MERV 11 is, is the highest that we can, we can manage. Um, but if, 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 if or is anybody able to just address the technology? Like how, what is different? How does the UV kill the virus differently than the HEPA does, for example? So I can, UVC, UV uh, doesn't, it doesn't remove the particles per se. It penetrates the whatever envelope, either human, human proteins and carbohydrates, and it, so it disrupts the RNA and the DNA within the uh, virus or bacteria. So it penetrates it because the short wavelength penetrates very effectively and, and makes it, renders it harmless, hopefully anyway. Okay, as opposed to the HEPA, which simply filters it out of the air. Filters, right. Yeah, the HEPA and the MERV are both filters. So they filter things. Sometimes you'll get a you'll get a uh, room air purifier that will also or, or another purifier system will also have a carbon filter. Carbon filters remove volatile organic compounds. They take out you know paint smells, formaldehyde, smoke, whatever. But so some some room air purifiers will have both types. The UVC kills the microbes, including the mold. So it's a it's, it's two different strategies. You're filtering and then you're killing those two things. And then the ventilation rate is the amount of time that you're refreshing and, and diluting your indoor air. And the CO2 is, is important as a, as a sort of a substitute for letting you know that you're doing your ventilation at an adequate rate. Your CO2, uh, we worry about uh, parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere for uh, climate change. We don't want to get over, we don't, we really like to be back to 350, but we're at about 450. The, the healthy range for indoor air for thinking clearly is under a thousand and preferably under 700 parts per million of CO2. And um, 
some schools, and I've read that uh, as many as 50% of our schools are in the 200, uh, 2,500 to 3,000 parts per million range. So it's no wonder the kids fall asleep in class. But, Excuse me, Jane, everyone, I got, I'm sorry, I have a call, uh, nursing, uh, senior living meeting right now at 11, so I have to jump off. Thank you very much, Stephanie. We appreciate it. Thanks, Thank you, everyone. Stephanie. Stephanie. Keep up the good work. Stephanie. Bye. Bye bye. Thanks a lot. Okay, Jane. I think okay. we can wrap. Yep. Any any questions that you want me to try to answer or direct to our speakers, I'll I'll look through the answers. Uh, and I'm I'm guessing that when people sign in, we also we have their email. Is that how that works in the contacts? Yes. Okay, yes. great. Right. Um, thank you all for attending. I appreciate it. Uh, Bert. Jane, thank you so much for organizing this. This was uh, lots of great information, uh, lots of things I, I learned today. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll, we'll process the video for this, um, and I will share the, the video, uh, the slide, the slide decks, and also the chat, so everyone has a, a reference to some of the questions and answers that happened within the chat uh, to everybody who registered. Um, there might be a few of you online who uh, got an invitation uh, separately and so if if you want to make sure that I get your um, information so you can get that information when it becomes available uh, so again thanks to um, all of our sponsors uh, for helping us uh, make this a, a wonderful presentation today uh, uh, Jane thank you for your work organizing this Robin thank you for your work as well uh, Scott thanks for um, for all the great information and to Onset for, for being a great member of the Tech Council. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank everybody for being here today. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed it. Um, feel free to ping me with any questions and I'll pass them on. And I'll look forward in the next few days to some follow-up uh, uh, on this event. So thank you all. Take care. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Thank